The book of Jeremiah, chapter 1, Jeremiah's call and commission. Now the word of the Lord came to me, saying, Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. And before you were born, I consecrated you. I appointed you a prophet to the nations. Then I said, Ah, oh, Lord God, truly, I do not know how to speak, for I am only a boy. But the Lord said to me, Do not say I am only a boy, for you shall go to all to whom I send you, and you shall speak whatever I command you. Do not be afraid, for I am with you to deliver you, says the Lord. Continuing where we left off in chapter 4 of Luke, Jesus has just arrived home. Then Jesus began to say to them, Today this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. All spoke well of him and were amazed at the gracious words that came from his mouth. They said, Is not this Joseph's son? He said to them, Doubtless you will quote me this proverb, Doctor, cure yourself. And, he will, and you will say, Do hear also in your hometown the things that we have heard you did at Capernaum. And he said, Truly I tell you, no prophet is accepted in the prophet's hometown. But the truth is, there are many widows in Israel. There were many widows in Israel in the time of Elijah. When the heaven was shut up for three years and six months, and there was a severe famine over all the land, yet Elijah was sent to none of them except to a widow at Zarephath in Sidon. There were also many lepers in Israel in the time of the prophet Elisha, and none of them was cleansed, except Naaman the Syrian. When they heard this, all in the synagogue were filled with rage. They got up, drove him out of town, and led him to the brow of the hill on which their town was built so that they might hurl him off the cliff. But he passed through the midst of them and went on his way. Here ends today's reading. completely, but I do want to say the anger of the crowd, huh? Do we see that kind of contentiousness, powerful, dangerous contentiousness in our life right now? The whole notion of all the healing that Jesus does in the Bible. Oh, I'm going to take this off. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> um, uh, all the healing that Jesus does in the Bible. And yet you think how many people weren't healed? You know, so what's the healing about? Are certain people more important? But then I've studied it in such a way that says that the healings were to point towards something. It's not that Jesus doesn't care about everyone, wouldn't want to heal everyone and make everyone well, but the healings had more of a purpose than just the, 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 the um, welfare of the person. It was also him speaking the message. Um, so I think that's some of what he's getting in here when he talks to the crowd and, and uh, what they don't understand. <laughs> Lately, inspired by my readings in the Gospel of Luke, I've been reflecting on the value of ecumenism, ecumenical, of a respect and reverence for diversity in the way human beings throughout time ritualize and experience the sacred, and how they apply these values in living worthy lives and making a world a more compassionate place. In today's story, Jesus was run out of town by the people most familiar with him, his town folk. I began reflecting on this image and the way we separate what we feel to be sacred and what we feel to be ordinary. This separation has not, that we divide things up like this, has not led to greater joy or to an experience of the holiness of life, but to a vacuum of the spirit in the ordinary everyday life, think of the values we see expressed out on the street compared with what we say in church, right? 
So dividing that lead to a vacuum in the spirit of the ordinary everyday life and a formality of emptiness in religious life, kind of an empty ritual, an empty process. This separation becomes then not a recognition of both the sacred and the ordinary as very important aspects of life, but leads instead to a denial or a lack of respect for one or the other. We've lost so many wonderful human beings and spiritual souls in the last few years, even few weeks. On January 22nd, the world lost the beloved Buddhist leader and Zen master Thich Nhat Hanh. He died peacefully at the age of 95 in a Buddhist temple in Vietnam. Thich Nhat Hanh was a spiritual leader, author of over 100 books, poet and peace activist, revered around the world. He taught mindfulness, global ethics, peacemaking, and applied his Buddhist insights into every aspect of society and education, business, technology, and the environmental crisis. Thich Nhat Hanh, in his living into mindfulness, held the sacred and the ordinary together in each present moment. Well, as I was preparing to write this week's message, I ran across an article by a woman named Beth Roth, who grew up in a Jewish family and as an adult grew to find great meaning in Buddhist teachings and practices, which she was able to integrate into the ancient rituals of her Jewish faith. Today, I would like to share several excerpts. It's rather lengthy. My sermon today really is a lot of her, her description of, uh, of this ritual. Um, today, uh, so it's called Family Dharma, the Sacred and the Ordinary, and it's found in the February 18th, 2009 uh, online publication, Tricycle, the Buddhist Review. Her revival of her Jewish rituals made me think of this revival for most of us in our own Christian tradition. And a man that I talked about last week and brought up a quote, uh, I quoted a writer named Dan Wakefield who had been an avowed atheist until he discovered the value and meaning of the seasons of the Christian year and how they punctuated his life with their sacred truth. He found meaning in the ritual of the Sabbath, like what we're doing today. And attending church each Sunday morning is a time of punctuating the ordinary and the sacred. And these became essential to his life. So today, Beth Ross describes a traditional ritual of her Jewish faith that was renewed in its importance. The excerpts I will include are about one of them, Havdalah, a weekly ritual of, of separation. And I, I, I just feel like the participatory, participatory nature of what she's talking about and the tangible nature of it would have been weird for me just to do in words. So I'm not pretending to do a ritual, but I'm kind of bringing the accoutrements of what she, she had in hers. Cinnamon, spices, the wine, and the light. I couldn't find a candle that crossed like this. <laughs> In the Jewish tradition of my upbringing, there is a ritual of prayers and candle lighting to welcome the Sabbath at sundown each Friday. There's another ritual bidding the Sabbath goodbye and entering the new week at sundown on Saturday. The ceremony is called Havdalah, which literally means separation. We are marking the separation between the Sabbath day and rest and reflection and the six days of the ordinary work week and activities. Although there's a broad continuum encompassing the varying degrees to which Jewish individuals and communities observe the Sabbath, to honor the Sabbath at all, just plain and simple, to stop and honor the Sabbath at all, is to recognize that Havdalah or separation does indeed exist. Beloved Vietnamese meditation master Thich not Han, urged Westerners not to abandon their religions of origin, even those who embrace some of the wonderful teachings of, of Buddhism, which, by the way, my daughter, who's online, I hope, right now, um, one Christmas gave me a, uh, a, a list of Buddhist teachings, even though she's very Christian, and it was a lovely Christmas gift. Uh, 
Okay, let's see where I am. Okay, uh, rather, Thich Nhat Han encourages us to explore what Buddhism offers and to take to heart the Buddhist teachings and practices that enable us to decrease personal and communal suffering and to promote greater love, healing, and peace in our lives and our world. He calls Buddhism, and this is interesting, the strongest form of humanism that we have. You know, sometimes we, well, to another sermon, explaining that it came to life so we could learn to live with responsibility, compassion, and loving kindness. Anya. Just as I love and respect the teachings of the Buddha and his legacy of healing meditation practices, I've also grown to love celebrating the major Jewish holidays, the Sabbath, Rosh Hashanah, Yom Kippur, Passover, Hanukkah. I agree with Dalai Lama when he says, Other, often we encounter things in another tradition that helps us better appreciate our own. Okay, I want to say right now, that's the point of the whole of the whole message this morning, right? My, um, how did I say that? Often we encounter things in another tradition that help us better appreciate our own. My understanding of the Buddha's teachings have enriched my observance of the major Jewish holidays and motivated me to modify traditional Jewish rituals and blessings in ways that reflect those teachings. So then Roth goes on to describe the ceremony, and I figured it was interesting to take time to do that today. Note as you listen how it integrates the senses, celebrating the taste and smell and warmth of light. For many years, the teachings of the Buddha have been integrated into my family's Friday night blessings and Saturday evening Havdalah ceremony. Havdalah is one of the most ancient Jewish rituals. It's beautiful, visual, participatory ceremony that consists of six interrelated parts. The introduction, the blessing for the wine, the blessing for the spices, the blessing for the lighting of fire, the blessing for Havdalah, or separation of Shabbat, from the six days of labor, and the conclusion. Different Jewish sources offer varied explanations for the symbolism of this ceremony. The introduction speaks about life and happiness. The wine symbolizes joy, the potential for healing pain in our lives and world. The sweet aroma of the spices represents the sweetness of the Sabbath day of rest, and others offer us a sweet smell in exchange for a Sabbath that is ending. The light is from a special braided Havdalah candle that contains multiple wicks. It reminds us that just as fire can be used for beneficial purposes or, or for destruction, our actions can create either happiness or suffering. We commit ourselves to choosing our actions wisely so that we can promote greater peace and harmony in ourselves, our families, our communities, and the world around us. Well, after the blessings for the wine and spices and light, the Havdalah blessing urges us to consciously recognize both the sacred and ordinary in our lives. Following the Havdalah blessing is a short Hebrew song about the prophet Elijah, who many Jews believe will herald the future time of ultimate redemption and happiness. The Havdalah ceremony then concludes with the wish for a good week. Well, here's how their family ceremony went. Our family's Havdalah ceremony follows this order. Each family member or any friends who have joined us for Saturday dinner has a written copy of the ceremony. We assemble in the dining room and light the Havdalah candle. One of my children reads, with compassion and loving kindness, we honor all things, all beings, nature and life itself. May all beings live in peace be free from suffering and no true happiness. I want you all to be thinking about our own rituals at home as I read through these rituals. And one lovely thing to do is to create your own rituals based on your faith um, experience, your understanding of Christian teachings. And one of the ways that we've encouraged this in the past is Advent. And that's why last year we did the Advent, we sent the Advent uh, wreath makings home so people could do that together as a family and then could punctuate the weeks of Advent together. So just think of that in terms of the rituals of our own Christian faith. 
Next, we raised the, we raised the spice box, and I did find one stick of cinnamon. And then they passed the spice box around. Woo! My brother-in-law gave me this one Christmas. It's the king's. Well, oh, this is Mary and Joseph following the star to get to the manger. Uh, inside of it is fresh ground cinnamon. We read the explanation for the spices. Say the blessing in Hebrew and English and circulate the spice box for each person to enjoy the sweet aroma. I don't, I guess we better not do that during COVID, huh? All righty. We say the added soul Shabbat confers is leaving now. The sweetness of these spices consoles us at the moment of its passing and reminds us that all things rise and pass away. May our awareness of the impermanence of life help us to experience each moment as precious and may our every action serve to heal the world of pain. Blessed is the guardian of the universe who brings forth all the spices. Then after the spices have been circulated, the burning candle is held up and all gather closer. And I love this part to see the interplay of light and shadow. And I can see the shadow of my own hand right here as I hold it. Um, we bless the light and offer gratitude for the Sabbath. Blessed is the guardian of the universe who brings forth the fire, the light of fire. We give thanks for the Sabbath day that is now ending. We are grateful for its many blessings, for peace and joy and rest for the body and refreshment for the soul. May something of its meaning and message remain with us as we enter the new week, lifting all that we do to a higher plane of holiness and inspiring us to work with new heart for the liberation of all beings. May the quiet of our Sabbath open our hearts to all the miracles of life. In the week ahead, may we continue to cultivate compassion, loving kindness, ethical conduct, truthful speech, and deep listening. I think I forgot to raise the cup of wine. Next is the short, joyous song about Elijah. Ela, Eliyahu Hanavi. And then the Havdalah blessing in Hebrew, which we revised in English to say, blessed is the guardian of the universe who separates sacred from ordinary, light from darkness, the seventh day of rest from the six days of labor. May the Sabbath day help us see the commonplace in the holy and feel the sacred in the ordinary. May we live both the sorrows and joys of life. The Sabbath day offers the possibility of slowing down, of being mindful, of connecting more deeply with what is most meaningful to us. Havdalah is a potent reminder. Let's think of what the potent reminders are in our lives, that human beings embody two complementary aspects, the sacred, and the ordinary. And of course, we know the Quakers within the Christian tradition are noted for that particular thing as well. The most ordinary, the most common, all of us as priests to each other. The people in Nazareth on that day were, this is me, <laughs> were offended that Jesus, Joseph's son, who was too familiar, an ordinary human being like themselves, spoke of his holiness and pointed to their own. Later, they would condemn him for associating with the wrong people for healing on the Sabbath. Jesus taught that the sacred and the ordinary are complementary, not opposing aspects of even the most familiar, ordinary things of life. He taught in parables using the most ordinary people, places, events, and things. What are some of those, guys? Some of the things he pick, pulled up in parables, salt, water, water. Mustard what? Mustard seed. Mustard. mustard seed. Oh, wow. Thank you. <laughs> Go. What else? Please. Weed. <laughs> okay. I think I better, if I'm going to do this, I better get a little hearing aid here. <laughs> yeah, everything he talked about was just the stuff around him. And sometimes it feels like it's not that because those things aren't necessarily stuff around us anymore. 
So we have to almost update the parables in a way and say, what's the stuff around us that's holy? You know, what are the things in our life that are holy? He taught us parables using these, our Sabbath Sunday morning and the Hebrew ritual of both Shabbat and Havdalah separate only to call to greater attention the fundamental integration of the sacred and the familiar, the holy and the ordinary. So in closing, I would like to share a simple but life-changing quote from the late Thich Nhat Hanh to give honor to this great life at this historic moment of his passing. Just simply this, people usually consider walking on water or in thin air a miracle. But I think the real miracle is not to walk either on water or in thin air, but to walk on earth. Every day we are engaged in a miracle which we don't even recognize. A blue sky, white clouds, green leaves, the black curious eyes of our child, our own two eyes, all is a miracle. Amen.